Right, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming today. Uh, my name is Kevin Avertel. I am a political science professor and the Democracy Commitment Coordinator. And today's event is about the implications of overturning Roe v. Wade. Um, so today we have three panel members joining us. I'd like each of them to introduce themselves. Sure. Uh, my name is Mary Vifuis. I teach uh, political science and history and sociology, and I'm also the college's study abroad coordinator. And I am Lisa Battisfor. I am the founder of an organization called Reproductive Transparency Now. And um, we hold direct actions outside of crisis pregnancy centers, which are anti-abortion organizations that we'll talk a little bit more about as part of the session. Hi, I'm Tish Hayes. I'm the information literacy librarian here. Great, thank you everyone. Um, I wanted to start off by letting you know we have uh, a lot of information that we could um, share with you today, but feel free to ask questions along the way if there's anything in particular that you wanted us to talk about. We'll make sure that we get to that, and I know that there's a microphone in the back for, for all of you. So to start off with, we wanted to provide a little bit of a historical background of how we got to um, this past summer's decision that overturned Roe v. Wade. So I'm going to start off with uh, Professor Fafuis. Thank you, and I'm gonna stand up here just because I, I tend to do a little bit better when I'm kind of moving around and talking. So, um, okay, uh, I'm gonna try not to be too verbose here. I have a tendency to do that sometimes, so, my, so cut me off, get the, get the hook out if I'm going a little bit too long here. Um, I'm not sure if a lot of you are aware of this, but actually abortion in this country was not illegal until the 19th century, until the 1800s. Um, most states did not have statutes against it until roughly like around mid mid 1800s when doctors were um, kind of like not liking the fact that they were getting supplanted by a lot of midwives um, and thinking that you know they were kind of superior knowledge of obstetrics and, and gynecology and so kind of pushed for this and um, this st states to pass uh, laws that would uh, ban abortion and so there wasn't necessarily from the founding of the country that there were laws banning abortion. I just want to make that clear because I think it's going to be something that maybe people are not aware of. So let's go ahead and um, kind of get into this a little bit. So I'm going to fast forward here to the 20th century and talk about more about Supreme Court cases. So many of you may not be aware of this because it's just one of those things that you may not think of, right? Um, there was, it used to be illegal in this country to be able to access contraception. So, I mean, that's why the organization of Plant Parenthood got started to begin with from Margaret Sanger in the 1920s because uh, contraception was not a, a legal practice, a legal uh, uh, thing for women to obtain. And in, in 1965, the Supreme Court ruled in a case where a Connecticut couple sued the court saying, like, we have a right to be able to not have a kid if we don't want one when we want one, uh, that basically it's not fair for, for contraception to be illegal. Um, and so that was basically the argument that they, they based it under are a couple different amendments that you could see up here, the first, third, fourth, and fifth, and also under the 14th amendment, the idea of due process. And this is kind of the basis that sets up the case of Roe versus Wade in 1973. And, and there's a, another one, but I'm, this is the main one, right? So of course, this is a case where a, a woman, uh, Norma McCorvey, takes the name of, of Roe, the idea of, of, of you know, um, as a pseudonym, um, files a case against the district attorney of Dallas, Henry Wade, basically saying that she had a right to be able to, to, to access uh, an abortion. And the court essentially, um, the, the law in the books in Dallas said that basically, that unless uh, there was a, um, an issue that the woman's life was at stake, that abortion was completely illegal. And the court ruled in a pretty landmark decision, seven to two, that basically a woman has a right to have an abortion. And using this, this right, this Gideon precedent now, and precedent is what the term the court uses to talk about like cases that you that came before that they used to rely on. This is a little spotty. The uh, thank you. I'll switch them out. Sorry. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so the, the, so precedent is the idea that the court looks at cases that came before to rely on them to make their decisions that they're making now, right? And so the the idea that that um, a woman would have access in all trimesters, but states were given these leeways to limit it as kind of they needed, right? So as time goes on, there are some different laws that came across, and I'm not going to get into all of them, but there are different other cases where Roe was challenged through the 80s. Um, but for the most part, they upheld it. Well, then we get to another landmark case in 1992, Planned Parenthood versus Casey, a, a Pennsylvania statute that basically said that um, a married, a couple of the different things. One of them was that a married woman had to inform her husband um, before having an abortion. Um, there was a 24-hour waiting period, um, and then a, a, kid, a, a person had to get a, um, a woman had to get the consent of her parent if she was a minor, among a couple of other things. And so the court in this case was the first time where they really kind of narrowed, 
abortion rights. So what you can see on there are a couple different things. So that they said that basically a woman has a right to get an abortion in the first trimester, but they added this caveat. Oops, sorry, here we go. That the state cannot place what's called an undue burden on a woman. So she can seek an abortion in the first trimester, but the, the state cannot have that undue burden. The undue burden, though, is what we get into in later cases that the court has to define what does it mean to be an undue burden? What does that term even mean? Um, it goes on to say that, this, that states have the power to be able to make laws to restrict abortion in the, in the second and third trimesters. Um, and from there, kind of states take that and they kind of run with it. And so from there, you have these, these, these subsequent rulings where states are, are they pass, it's a, I, but a thousand different statutes um, at the state level. Um, and that was just since 2010. So that's even more, we're talking thousands, trying to limit abortion rights. I mean, and there's so much that you that we could talk about that I want to. I don't want to take up too much time, but just about abortion doctors uh, being assassinated and violence at abortion clinics, and um, you know, there's a lot of different things. Um, in, in 2003, Congress passes what's called the Partial uh, Partial Birth Abortion Ban Act. The court upheld. Now, this is this in and of itself, and we could talk about this a little bit more as we go on. Is not quite a, and even even a, a, a correct even uh, medical term, but we can we can you know talk about that as, as we go. Um, this gets into some of the different restrictions that have that what the uh, states have been trying to do since then, like looking at trying to, re trying to restrict pills, um, things about getting counseling and parental involvement, et cetera, et cetera. Which then brings us to the case of 2022. Now the court had already earlier in the year had declined to take up a, uh, had struck down a Texas statute um, that was pretty much a pretty big encroachment on Roe versus Wade. And that should have been a warning signal to all of us that they probably were going to go ahead with this. Now, it's, it, it's also important to note that in between that time, the court now had a majority. And this is something that Professor Navratil and I talked about in a previous um, uh, session that we had about talking about the court, um, that, that Donald Trump had promised when he was running for president that he would get uh, pro-life judges on there that would overturn Roe versus Wade. And that worked. He got evangelical Christians on board to support it and to, uh, to eventually overturn it. And so in June of 2022, as many of you know, um, in this ruling that was six to three, uh, these, this case of, of the Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health was uh, Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood as previous cases were now overturned. Which meant that basically, it doesn't mean that in Illinois where, where abortion rights are still protected that you cannot, can no longer get an abortion. It means that at the federal level, that a woman's right to have an abortion is no longer protected at the, in the first trimester. Because it meant that even if you're in Kansas or you're in Texas or you're in Alabama, and let's say that you know abortion may be limited much more narrowly in, in the second or third trimester, because the court, by the way, in Roe, set up the idea of trimesters, and that's how we kind of measure when uh, how, and how abortion should be limited. Now it's saying that basically not even in the first trimester, which was supposed to be like kind of a sacrosanct right, now it's no longer protected at all. So if you're in a state where you have abortion rights already, you're cool. And if you were following the election last week, a bunch of states now enshrined like Michigan um, and Kansas over the summer was kind of a big one. And then Kentucky, which was uh, expected that it was a very, very narrow, um, narrow passage, but Kentucky basically decided to not um, enshrine abortion ban on their, in their constitution, in their, their, in their state constitution. So this was basically saying that the court, though their ruling was, okay, we're gonna send this back to the states that Roe was wrongfully, it was argued incorrectly. It never should have been argued the way that it was. And it should always be a, it's, it was not constitutionally correct. And it should be returned to the states and let states decide how they want to regulate it. And that kind of has its own, its own issues, issues with it that we can discuss some more. And then of course, some of you may, be, may remember that this was also leaked earlier in the year, which people then found out about it. And that's never happened before um, in any, any history of the court, any case where the entire decision was pretty much uh, leaked before, which gives you an idea of what a big deal this was. We still don't know who actually leaked um, the decision. So this kind of gives you the, the basics of it. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll kind of turn it over to our colleagues because we all have a lot to say and I don't want to take up too much time. So, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Professor Fleece. Um, and that kind of leads us to the point of, of now 
what is the impact of Dobbs? Like, what does that do? So Professor Fafuis just talked about how now states are really going to go their own direction. Um, states like Illinois have um, more protections for abortion rights, whereas neighboring states like Indiana do not. So Lisa, do you want to take it from here about yeah. what the impact of Dobbs is going to do? Yeah, so there are a few elements of this to cover. So one thing to understand is that Roe affirmed the right to privacy under the 14th Amendment. And there are many other issues that were also covered in the 14th Amendment related to the right to contraception, uh, the right to marry who you want. Um, and so what that means is there could be serious implications for LGBTQ rights. There could be serious implications for access to contraception as a result of this decision. And furthermore, um, something to really take into account is when there is no federal protection, the laws can then vary by state. So, you know, to that point, you know, we're seeing abortion bans at various points in pregnancy in different states throughout the country. And in fact, they are changing constantly. So uh, as an activist, right, I'm very plugged into various organizations who um, provide abortion funding for people who need to travel. I'm very plugged into uh, abortion clinics across various states, and they are struggling right now to keep up with the various um, legal requirements because abortion is legal one day, and then it's not the next, and then it is the next day. And hanging in the balance are people who are making very important life decisions and they're being yanked around and this is as a result of this decision uh, in the Dobbs case and so I really just want to challenge everybody to to think about these issues you know at extra layers there is so much nuance here it's not just abortion uh, is legal or not there are so many other issues tied into it and there are real people tied into it and we know from the research that people of color and people with low incomes are going to be disproportionately harmed by these policies. And so we all have a responsibility to look out for each other and protect each other's rights. Thank you, Lisa. Um, one of the, just to play devil's advocate a little bit, one of the arguments that I've heard is that, well, if, if you live in India, an abortion restriction, let's say at six weeks or whatever the state policy may be, and you know of states like Illinois where there is better access to, to abortion, then people can just uh, travel, that you can, uh, you can go to one of those states and, and have a, an, an abortion there. So what, what is your response to that argument? My response? Well, any, anybody of the panel members? I do have a response. <laughs> um, that costs money, okay? It costs money to travel. It costs money to get childcare. It costs money to take time off of work. Mm -hmm. It's not just easy to say, oh yeah, I'll just travel across state lines. You know who's able to do that? People who have financial resources, uh, typically white people, right? So again, this is where that issue comes in of people of color being disproportionately harmed. Because the fact of the matter is, it's not that easy to just pick up and go ac across state lines. And furthermore, a lot depends too on where you're at in the pregnancy. So, you know, depending on, you know, which state you can get to, where you can get an appointment, all of these things are variables that people have to navigate. Yeah, and just to jump in and kind of build on that, I think, you know, when I think about the biggest implications of this, um, all of those things, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and I think that when we start, and this is not new to the Dobbs decision, but I think the Dobbs decision definitely heightens it. When we stop thinking about abortion as something that is a medically necessary part of reproductive care, that it's something that um, we need to have access to, um, to, to better our health and well-being, um, mental, physical, and otherwise, um, we, once we start getting away from that, um, it, and, and really thinking about um, health as, as something that's politicized and that like the, the um, information around that health that's politicized, it starts to get very, very scary. I mean, we see that happening around COVID, we see it happening around gender affirming healthcare for 
young people in states. And so when we start having um, just a debate and a politicization of medical care and medical health and the science around it, I think we're in really dangerous territory and it sets up um, like much broader implications for all of us um, and definitely impacts those people who can't afford it. You know, I think when we, I, th I think your point is, is really important. In, in, in terms of the overall kind of health implications, I think that's something that's overlooked. And I, t I told them I'm gonna just share a brief anecdote of what happened to me last year. Um, I don't think I understood it as well even myself until I kind of went through something. Um, last year I had a, um, and I'm, I'm in my mid 40s and I'm, I'm childless, so this is not a situation I've ever been in, but I had a, uh, a tumor in my right ovary. And so I was told by the doctor, this is gonna have to be removed. Um, and so we, we set up the surgery, had it all set to go. And he, we, he'd already said to me, because he knew me for many years, he said, well, I know you don't want to have any kids, so we'll just, you know, do you want to, we'll go ahead and remove your, your left fallopian tube as long as your right, as long, along with your right fallopian tube. I said, great. The day before the surgery, he calls me and says, well, the hospital we're supposed to do it at um, is a Catholic hospital, and we cannot remove your left fallopian tube unless there is a problem with it. Medically speaking, there's, if there's nothing wrong with it, we can't take it out. And I was like, well, if you and I both think it should be taken out, why can't it just be taken out? I said, I won't tell anybody if you don't tell anybody. <laughs> He's like, he could lose his medical license if you were to go ahead and do that without it. So I had a decision where he's like, well, you could just wait. If you wanted, you could just wait and postpone it. And so I was in, in this, this decision where I'm like, well, I could wait, because unlike what Lisa pointed out, I, I don't have basically, I have basically the resources where I could have waited. I don't have kids, I didn't have kids. Um, you know, that I was, that were depending upon me. I wasn't teaching that day. I didn't have to take off work. I didn't have to travel to another state to go do it. But I was in pain because I had a pretty large size tumor that was pressing down on my spine and it was hurting. So I didn't want to wait for another week or two weeks so I could find a hospital that would, that would perform, perform this, the procedure. So I went ahead and, and did it there and the, the tumor ended up being cancerous. So I had to go and then have a a hysterectomy a month later. So my point is, I, I did learn a kind of a lesson with that, A, go to a <laughs> university teaching hospital, which I will always do from, from now on. But it did really reinforce to me the idea that if you don't have the resources, um, that it's not that easy just to say, well, go someplace else. It's not, because there are other implications that are involved in simply saying, go someplace else. So just a little anecdote. Again, it's not, you know, but it, it, at least it gives you a, nice, a sense of the personal and why this, why this is very personal for so many people because it's, it, it is complicated and it is nuanced and it's not just something you could say. And I also do want to add though too, that if anybody here, no matter what your views are, we want to hear them. So if you have, you know, if you want to, you've got questions or you've got comments that you want to make that even are at, at odds with what we're saying, that's okay. I mean, we're here to kind of have a discussion and, and talk about this. So, so please, I want to kind of make that clear that, that we, we welcome um, any and all comments to this, so. Thank you, Mary. Thanks for sharing your personal story. And, and with that, we'll take a pause and see if there's some comments from the audience. I have a similar story to what happened with Mary. Uh, a friend of a friend needed a, a procedure uh, like that, but couldn't get in because partly because there were people coming in from other states mm -hmm. as a result of some of the confusion and, and they thought, well, we don't really know where this is gonna settle and so to be safe, I'm gonna go to Illinois. Well, that's taking up spaces for people in Illinois and she ended up delaying her surgery which, which made it more dangerous and more complicated. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly, those, those types of stories. So even with, when you live in a state like Illinois that might have more abortion protections, there's still an impact because of all the increased demand for services. I know that uh, we were thinking, I'm sorry. Did no, you no, no, go ahead. No. Um, of, of some of these examples that, that may have been in the media that have been uh, covered quite um, with a lot of attention. And there was the uh, story of a, the 10 year old girl from Ohio. Um, and, 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 and so I know that Tish is information literacy librarian wanted to kind of shed light on that and the way that misinformation and media attention uh, on some of these high profile cases. Sure, I can talk a little bit about that. Um, that's a, a incredible case where we have um, a real news story um, and a, a real situation that um, Republicans uh, try to spin into, and anti-abortion proponents try to spin into um, calling it misinformation. And so that then became misinformation. Um, so it got a little bit wild out there. Um, and I think this is a good time to kind of talk about the maybe the differences. Misinformation is the unintentional spread of false or misleading 
information, which happens all the time. And we all have probably spread misinformation accidentally. It's a thing that, it's the thing that we do. Um, gossip could be misinformation, right? Um, but then disinformation is similar, but it's intentionally spread. So oftentimes, um, and this is I think where um, we really need to be concerned about um, uh, folks in the anti-abortion camp um, and, and what's happening on social media and around cases like the 10-year-old is when there's um, information that's created to um, uh, advance a political agenda, to advance um, an idea about what abortion is or is not that isn't true. Um, and so, can I just jump into sure. some of the other um, social media implications and things like that? I think, um, I think one of the things that uh, I found really interesting in doing the research for all of this is, like, the case of the 10-year-old from Ohio in some ways is extraordinary because um, I think it was watching something unfold um, that I don't think we get to see unfold very often, which is like the social media spin around something. And also, oh yeah, yeah, I can yeah. talk a little bit. <laughs> Apologies. So this summer, um, there was a news story that um, popped up about a 10 year old um, who needed an abortion. And this 10 year old lived in Ohio and Ohio had um, anti-abortion laws on the books. and. Could, could not get an abortion within Ohio, so needed to travel to Indiana to get that service. Um, and I think the case of a 10-year-old needing an abortion brings up a lot of feelings, I would imagine. Um, how that 10-year-old you know, got pregnant, the, the procedure, then, like the trauma that that 10-year-old is gonna have to go through, all of it. And so I think that made it really like this kind of story that people got drawn to, but immediately Republicans started saying, well, no, that's not true. That is not a real story. There's no way a 10-year-old needs an abortion. There's no reason that they would have to travel. And it got people really riled up because I think it taps into, again, all of those emotions. We don't wanna believe that a 10-year-old needs an abortion, but in fact, um, a huge number of 10 to 14-year-olds do need abortions in every state, every month of the year. And it's, and it's upsetting and tragic, but it's also real and something that we need to like be able to reckon with. So Republicans said that it wasn't true, and then it turns out it was. Um, it's just that one of the other problems with misinformation and one of the problems with kind of the way the media handles these stories is that traditionally um, journalists need multiple sources to verify a story, right? But in this case, we have a 10-year-old and their doctor and maybe their parent. And so there aren't multiple sources, because there shouldn't be. There doesn't need to be a whole bunch of people who know about this 10-year-old, right? Like, they have some right to privacy, and this is a medical situation. And so, because journalists couldn't verify it outside of the doctor and the person who needed the abortion, then journalists weren't willing to report it as a true story. And so that's one of the complications that we have around um, the issue of abortion when we have a very traditional publishing model within news that isn't willing to kind of move with like the medical um, uh, responses or it doesn't isn't willing to report on a controversial issue without having the other side when in fact there actually isn't another side there is just the truth of what happened and I think this is the thing that I think comes up a lot within around news coverage um, and around social media issues is that we, we want to think of, you know, the pros and the cons. We want to think of, you know, the ver all of the different sides. But we also have something that is a medical accurate, you know, description of, of a procedure versus um, a lot of things that are made up. And we're going to talk about some crisis pregnancy centers later, but I think that's one of the places where that comes up a lot, too. Yeah. Just checking in again, seeing if there's any comments or questions so far. If you could hold on for just a second for the microphone. <laughs> so as a woman and as a professional, um, I, I feel like I have a mathematical mind and so I try to look at all these things in, in a very logical way, but it's hard to separate this topic from feelings. Um, and as a mother of four, and all four of my children were very, very early where they were in the NICU, it's hard for me to wrap my, my head around one day earlier and one day after their birth. And one day I could get, have an abortion, 
and then the next day they're a baby, and now I can't. Like, what's the difference between one day? And on the day they were born, they had a shot, and they cried because they, they felt, and mm-hmm. their heart beat, and they were real babies. Mm-hmm. And so it's hard for me to have 28-week-old babies that were real babies, and then one day earlier they were not babies. So that is hard for me to wrap my head around. But I will say I don't want any of my rights taken away ever. Mm-hmm. And, and it is a slippery slope, right? Mm-hmm. This is... This is something where we, you know, there's so many implications. I am a privileged person because I have a family, I have a job, I have access, I have a doctor. You know, so it is such a slippery slope, but I think that we, we sometimes forget that these are little, they're babies. Mm-hmm. And when are they not babies and when are they babies? Because when that, when I had the baby, they weren't supposed to be born. So mm-hmm. did I have a baby that wasn't a baby yet? You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So it, it's such a slippery slope. But again, I am a person that I don't want any of my rights taken away. Sure. And both things can be true. Yes. It can be, both things can be true. Like, I think yes. you're raising a really good point. I think that there's, like, common ground. I'm sorry, ladies, do you mind that I, that I kind of jumped in on this? I think there's common ground that we could be finding. I think that's a lot of people kind of feel the, in the sense that you support. Okay, first of all, most women, the, I'm glad that you brought this up, because the vast majority of women, so when we talk about the second trimester of women seeking abortions, women don't walk into an abortion clinic, like, at 36 weeks, and they're like, you know... I think I just changed my mind. Right. I don't want this kid anymore. No, when you're at that point, you have like a crib picked out, you have a dame picked out, you've got like, the, you're ready for this baby. I mean, it's not like women just decide willy nilly, I'm not gonna have a baby. Um, Cause if, if the baby can survive outside of the womb, most states do have like laws, even Illinois does, that after the point of viability, um, it's restricted unless it's, unless it's for the health of the life, life of the mother or the fetus, baby. Um, so this idea that, that I think that you're, that there's more common ground that I, I think that we could agree on if we just kind of got past that point, but the term, even like the term of like, uh, late term abortion or partial, those are not even real medical terms that doctors do. They don't use those terms uh, and any, I want to just throw this out there just for like an abortion is any type of pregnancy that is not, does not make it full term basically is considered an abortion an aborted pregnancy. So even if you, if, whether it's spontaneous because it happens because you have a miscarriage or because you've chosen to have an elective abortion, any pregnancy that does not go full term is considered an, an abortion, an aborted pregnancy, excuse me. So, but th- these terms have been politicized and have been used to kind of like scare people and they th- and people think that too. Nobody wants to see the idea of like, you know, and, and some of the terms even, you know, and, and former President Trump was saying things like, you know, and they ripped the baby out of the womb. And like, I mean, that, that, those things just, they don't happen. You're not going to find doctors who are going to be like, oh yeah, I'm going to go perform an abortion at like 38 weeks. Like that, does, you're not going to find that. So when it does happen, like there was a, a and I urge you all, there's a really interesting and really sad um, uh, piece. I can maybe give it to, to Troy, maybe put on the website if it's possible or a link to it. Um, on Vice News about women in Georgia who had to have uh, abortions in the second trimester, it's because their their babies there was something wrong with them, or they were going to die themselves if they did not have an, have the abortion, and they had to listen to like women or people shouting outside the clinic, "You're you're a baby killer, you're this, you're that, whatever," um, as they're having this horrible procedure done because they kind of had to. Um, so it's, I think there's a it's, you're you're raising you're raising a good point, and I think in addition to that something to think about is when life begins really is dependent on your not only your own personal views but your religious views because where we are at right now where we're seeing a lot of this politicization is a result of a christian ideology and not everybody in the u.s is christian and not everybody shares those views Mm -hmm. um I know in the um, abortion advocacy landscape, you know, a very prevalent view is the life of the pregnant person always takes precedent. And there's obviously going to be a difference in how they approach things if it's a wanted pregnancy versus an unwanted or unplanned pregnancy. And so what worked, for example, for you, you know, perhaps the circumstances would have been different, as you mentioned, if you didn't have the resources to be able to make it work. And that is enough, in my view, and in a lot of people's views, to make it you know, a decision that that person should be able to make. And something I really do want to highlight, because we're talking about some like sensational examples, right? I really want to make sure that, you know, everyone you know knows that 
having an abortion is it's safe and it's common and there is absolutely no shame attached to it no matter when or why or how you decide to have one or more um, so there is no shame in having abortion and i think that's something else we really have to fight in our society is the stigma absolutely and just to jump in on that the the stigma around abortion is one of the primary um, concerns with this misinformation, disinformation, and the way that our news media reports on abortion because of the different, I think, lies um, or the medical, um, dis the distortion of medical facts, which happens both in media and in at crisis pregnancy centers. Those things then filter into a kind of our our day to day conversations around what abortion is. And so even if I've never like looked up information about abortion or maybe I'm not following those things kind of get in my head. And then I have these um, frameworks for thinking about abortion that aren't just aren't true. Um, one of the things um, one of the articles that I found really interesting is this study called shaping stigma an analysis of mainstream print and online news coverage of abortion. They revealed that the coverage uh, perpetuated stigma in many ways um, through the frequent use of inflammatory language distributions. Um, there's also just evidence that news does not cover abortion as a health issue. Um, they use um, inflammatory language and they don't often cover women's abortion stories. So if we have a narrative that only sees abortion as this thing that's negative or this thing that's taking life, um, and that's kind of the framework that we have, it's really hard then for us to see that actually, again, it's this medical, it's something that happens um, all the time. So, and lots of people make the decision to have an abortion and it's a common medical practice. It's very safe um, and it doesn't need to be something that people feel shame about. And it is like over 90%, and correct me if I'm wrong, you guys, 90% of, of abortions that occur, if not more, are done in the first trimester. Mm -hmm. So in, in some yeah, cases, was, like with, with the, you know, we're talking like with literally the size of like a pea, it, like it, or even just a, a little bit bigger than that. And we're talking, it's, it's tissue at that point. And I know that sounds like it's kind of, it's kind of a gross thing to say, but there, there is truth to that. And so this, this notion of when is it a baby versus when it's a fetus and what do you, what is the terminology that you use? And there's something that's really interesting that, that I wanted to bring up from the, um, uh, the, the court, the case itself, the Dobbs decision itself. And this is, this is actual oral arguments that were heard between the justices and the lawyers who were arguing for and against it. Cause in a, in a Supreme court case, like the lawyers for and against something go before the justices and they make their arguments. So it's not like they're, they're trying an entire case from scratch, right? They're, they're trying kind of an, an idea, the argument, and the justices question them for about an hour, and it, that's pretty much the, the, the extent of it. And then the, the justices make a ruling based on, on things they've read and, and filings and other briefs that are kind of uh, uh, people that are for it or against it, et cetera. So one thing that's brought up by the, the lawyer who is on the, the pro-life side, uh, his name is uh, Mr. Stewart, and he's talking about the idea that of it, 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 there's a reason why that this needs to be re revisited, because Justice Sotomayor, who is in favor of retaining abortion rights was saying, you know, there's really nothing that's changed in medicine that really justifies why this is being put in place. And he said, well, this idea of like, you know, fetal pain and what the, what we know the child is doing, et cetera, et cetera. And she's like, well, there's, you know, according to like the, the, the science that there's a very small minority of doctors who believe that fetal pain exists before 24, 25 weeks. And that basically um, he says, well, the idea that if, you know, if you, if you poke an unborn life and it, it recoils, um, that is like the way that one of us would recoil. And she responds by saying, virtually every state defines a brain death as death. But literature is filled with episodes of people who are completely and utterly brain dead responding to stimuli. That's about 40% of dead people who if you touch their feet, the foot will recoil. So these are spontaneous acts by brain dead people. So she's like, I don't think a response by a fetus necessarily proves that there's a sensation of pain or that there's consciousness. So we're, there, I mean, we're talking about, that's the, the stuff that's really sensationalized. And I get, I get why it is, because it's, it evokes, it gets people's emotions stirred up and it gets people really upset. But for the most part, we're not, we're talking about very, very early on, that's the vast majority of abortions that even occur. So yeah, I, I think these are, this is a good dialogue. And I, I, I just to be clear, like the, the framework set up. When you use mine, this is yours. <laughs> the framework set up, after Roe v. Wade and essentially um, validated by Casey, is it, I should know this, but is it 23 weeks, 24 weeks? 
what was viab what was considered viability? Between 24 and 26 weeks. Okay, between 24 and 26. And the Dobbs decision was about at 15 weeks. Um, and, and just maybe, could you, could, does anybody want to speak to maybe the, the Roberts position in the Dobbs decision about? About the idea of. Um, so just that, so the, the Supreme Court really didn't have to go all the way in overturning Roe v. Wade. What the Dobbs decision was really about is can there be restrictions at 15 weeks? And it appears that, well, um, you know, Justice Roberts, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, thought that you know 15 weeks for Mississippi, that that was appropriate for that state to make that decision, but that it really wasn't a question for the court to decide to eliminate nationally all um, pr uh, abortion rights nationwide, that, that that really wasn't the question before them. So, you know, when we're talking about the, you know, 20, 24 weeks, 15 weeks, you know, perhaps there's some reason for debate there, but yet to, to completely eradicate uh, a right that had been in precedent for 49 years for a case that really wasn't before them. And I think we had had a, a similar, uh, we had a, a discussion on the Supreme Court's legitimacy a couple months ago in this idea of, you know, a Supreme Court that had upheld this right 7-2 versus now a, a Supreme Court that's 5-4 is a, is a very different direction. So one of the questions I just wanted to pose to the group and then we'll turn it back over to the audience again. So there's an argument to be made like, okay, these, these Supreme Court members, we don't elect them. They're nominated by um, presidents and approved by the Senate. Um, their mindset is like, hey, we shouldn't be making this, we shouldn't be making these decisions. Whether it was Roe v. Wade, that should have been something that the legislative branch decides. So if Congress wants to create a right to abortion, then they should do that. Uh, or absent of that, that this is really a, a state because of federalism, any power that's not explicitly granted in the Constitution is reserved to the states. So it should be reserved to the states. So I know it was covered earlier, but just want to highlight this again, that essentially the Supreme Court's saying, look, we're not, we're not anti-abortion per se. We're just saying that it should be decided at the state level. So I just wanted the group, and that, I know that maybe it's been mentioned in, in an abstract way, but wh why can't we just turn this over to the states and um, I think it was Alito, one of the justices said, you know, women have the right to vote now and, you know, we can control this at the state level. So, so I want to ask, I'm going to ask a question back um, regarding what the question you just asked. So do you recall what happened just a few weeks after the Dobbs decision, uh, what was proposed by Lindsey Graham? Yeah, the, the federal ban on abortion. So but, uh, yeah, I think when we talk about politicization of abortion, I think that's something really important to remember is they argued that, well, it should just be left up to the states, but then they proceeded to introduce uh, a federal abortion ban, which really disproves their position. And then looking at the argument uh, in isolation, leaving it up to the states, I think that takes us right back to um, the problem we talked about earlier, which is every state having very different laws, very different rules, forcing people um, who already have trouble accessing health care to have to navigate a very complicated system, um, not to mention with you know laws changing you know more frequently at the local and state level. So it just introduces a lot of complexities that harm people who can become pregnant to fulfill the um, perceived moral duties of, of a certain subset of citizens. Well, and not to mention the fact that I think that even talking about this in the context of federalism, I think you're already starting to see this as like, you know, the, the ramifications of this. Because, you know, when you're the underdog and you're fighting for something, so if you are like the pro-life groups and you've always had kind of Roe Ro versus Wade as sort of your, you know, as your enemy, and you're fighting this uphill battle against Roe versus Wade, it's easy to be like, you know, you're the underdog and you're fighting for something. Well, now they've gotten it, right? Now they've achieved it. So it's forced a lot of these, a lot of, uh, of politicians, which was kind of a litmus test to be part of the, of the Republican Party nowadays, which I want to emphasize did not used to be the case, you guys. There used to be, there were pro-life uh, Democrats and a lot of pro-choice Republicans. Ronald Reagan, who became president of the United States, was, was uh, governor of the state of California and had abortion access 
um, expanded for people in California. Um, it was, and it's only when he ran for president and was trying to get the support of evangelical Christians um, that this changed. There were a lot of, so, so this, the, the tents of the party kind of shrunk where they used to like kind of house a lot of like, I think there's only one, one, one pro-life Democrat that's still even in the house these days. Um, for the most part, it's, it's now you're either one or the other. So these litmus tests, like in order to be a Republican, you've got to be pro-life. And if you want to be a Democrat, you've got to be pro-choice. Um, and again, I'm not placing necessarily a judgment on their beliefs. It's just more of the idea that, that this is, it's become much more, much more hardened. But what we're seeing now, though, is that now that it's becoming, people are being forced to take a stance on it, this is the thing that most people across the United States widely believe should be up to the individual, with some maybe limitations at certain places. But for the most part, most Americans, public opinion polls show consistently that Americans believe firmly that, that a woman has a right to make that decision for herself. And that's not the place of the state to be involved in, in, in telling them what to do. So they're now they're finding themselves kind of on the defensive. And, and a lot of them are removing their pro-life stuff from their websites and you know trying not to appear so kind of partisan. So when Lindsey Graham proposed that federal abortion ban, all of a sudden they were all like, oh, retreat. Like nobody wanted to say, yeah, that's an awesome idea. Um, because that's now forcing them to take this stance that really it was easy to play from the sidelines all this time when it was never really that real. Does that make sense? But now it's real because Roe versus Wade has been overturned. So now the stakes are much higher and it's much a much big, bigger deal. And what we're starting to see already is it's states like, again, Kentucky and Kansas, those are not like, you know, super known to be, you know, bastions of, of, of liberality, right? These are states that were, that basically voted to not um, enshrine uh, to vote to enshrine abortion access for women, or, or at least not, not enshrine, I should say, an anti-abortion stance in their constitutions. Just to clear side, I grew up in Kansas, and it is it is very conservative, and I normally am just embarrassed about everything coming out of Kansas, and this was the first time that I was like, yes, <laughs> Kansas knows what it's doing. Good job, Kansas. And I think a really important point to highlight here as well is just because we live in Illinois doesn't mean abortion access is safe forever. We just had a midterm election that, you know, very much went in the uh, pro-choice or I call pro-abortion direction. Um, but that is not guaranteed. So I think something else to keep in mind is it is so important to be you know, civically active to know who's running, who are your local representatives and vote. Like do whatever you have to, whatever you can to make sure you can vote. Voting early, voting by mail, um, going on election day, because um, you'll have another chance, you know, in two years. Um, so make that, if you couldn't make it this time, make it next time, because this will be an ongoing fight. Um, the anti-abortion movement has never been an underdog. They aren't an underdog now. They have a lot of money, they're well organized, and they are coming for our rights. And it's not just limited to abortion rights. So just please do keep that in mind. And Lisa, like the way you changed your, the, the phrasing pro-choice versus pro-abortion, I feel like it's a really important point that we can just ask folks to dig into um, if, if some of this is maybe the first time you're thinking about it or maybe you're not sure where you stand. Um, one of the ways that I think uh, misinformation continues to spread is that we, we use these, this language, pro-life, pro-choice, um, and it can be really problematic because those don't necessarily mean the things that, yeah. The, yeah. that yeah. these different political organizations want them to mean. So, you know, Talk to the people that you care about. Talk to us. Talk to your professors. If if you know you still have some confusion about like what's on the line here or what those things might mean and, and the language around them. Thank you. And and now we I, I know you've been waiting a long time. So for questions and comments. Now, now all those thoughts have left. Oh, but no. um, <laughs> I have a few things probably off topic, but a sure. few things to say like comments to like kind of thought provoke someone um so we have people that want to tell you what to do with your body and at tw if you want to have a baby at 22 weeks if you have that baby early they won't save that baby they so i don't know why you have to be forced to have a child you know and then they end up not wanting to save that child when it comes to that time secondly those bleeding hearts that want to let you, you know, make you have that child. 
where are the resources after to support that child? Where are they after? Like, I feel like it should be community service to take care of a child in foster care or wherever, you know, they're at at that point. Are you feeding the mom and the child when they're struggling? You know, are you doing those things after they have that child? You force them to have that child. Because abortions come from a million reasons. It's not just a one night stand and oh, I don't want this kid. There's a million reasons why. And you know, if you're gonna make someone have a child, at least take care of them afterwards, you know? Where are the resources after that? So that's all I gotta say. <laughs> and you know what, also, if you have a spontaneous miscarriage, they label it as an abortion. I think that's so wrong too. Like, I don't know how that's an abortion when you didn't choose to have that either. It's just a medical term. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I just think those are all like, what is the real purpose of forcing people to have children when they don't want, what is, like, what does it come down to? It's political, and what is the real reason? Let's get down to that. Power. Right? Yeah, control. And controlling. The idea of controlling, I mean, I mean Justice uh, Ruth RBG, uh, may she rest in power, she said, um, the ability of women to participate equally in the economic and social life of the nation has been facilitated by their ability to control their reproductive lives. Uh, and that was from actually a decision that, that um, had to do with uh, contraception. Um, so, I mean, there's, that's, and that, that's uh, an issue that is, you know, if you don't have the ability to, to choose how you, how, when you want to have kids and, and how you want to have them and, you know, then you sometimes, it, it's again, it's, we're, we keep saying this again and again, again, this is extremely complicated. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, there's another quote I had here, but I wanted to, I don't know if anyone else wants to jump in while I'm finding my quote, but. Well, um, I, and I think um, you brought up, you, you started to work towards um, a term that I think is really important to raise um, in this venue, which is the term reproductive justice. Um, has anyone heard that term before? Like in the audience? All right, we got one. Okay, so reproductive justice is actually a term that was coined by a group of black women in the early 1990s, uh, right here in Chicago. And it's a combination of social justice and reproductive rights. And what it addresses is not just simply abortion rights, that's one aspect of it, but it's about uh, a person being able to have um, autonomy over whether to have children, whether to not have children, and the ability to raise children they do have in safe and sustainable communities. And that's super important to raise because it, it speaks to your point about uh, the social safety nets and social support um, to help people who want to have their children um, and have them be able to raise them in safe communities. And you know this goes to something that I'll talk a little bit more about when we get into crisis pregnancy centers, you know, the adoption industry. Often adoption is used as a substitute for abortion, which it really is not. Um, a couple will pay $50,000 to adopt a baby when really the mother of that baby probably could have used $2,000, kept her child, and raised it in a loving home. So again, it gets back to the power structure. Hi. Um Abortion is often considered like a women's issue, but the fact of the matter is it, like a lot of trans men and non-binary people also need access to abortion. And I just know in my like personal life, uh, that's not always seen the case of like accepting that mm -hmm. exists and that a lot of times non-binary and trans folks have even harder times to yes. get an abortion. So I was just wondering if you guys could talk about that and like what your professional opinions were on it. Yeah, so you may or may not have noticed, but I definitely say people who can become pregnant, um, pregnant people, um, it is really important to acknowledge that it's not just women who need abortions. Uh, people of all genders need abortions. There are men who have uteruses and can become pregnant, trans men, non-binary folks, and it's really important to acknowledge that. Thank you for bringing it up. Uh, just second that, yeah. Sorry. 
<laughs> Thank you so much for our comments. Um, they've been very, very helpful for our discussion. I just wanted to, we, we've still got about 20 minutes left. Just wanted to see if there was any other questions or comments before we, yeah, go ahead. Hold on, there's a microphone coming around. I was just wondering if somebody could address the, uh, the implications of uh, potentially uh, government um, restricting, uh, say, male contraception or uh, abortion methods, chemical abortion methods, seeing that you know, even now the, uh, over 50% of abortions, I believe, are, are, are chemical and, and potentially could be done through the male. <clears throat> I don't. I don't know a lot personally, Craig, about the idea of like the pills, but I know that's that is state. Some states have been de developing statutes already about that. But then that gets into like, you know, issues of like that are federal issues regarding mail and privacy, and and that's the privacy issue is 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 the bigger one. And I, I do have something that I had um, was looking at about the idea of just of privacy in general. Um, that <clears throat> so so even though the Constitution does not explicitly like you know guaranteed just a, there's no like right to privacy only in the constitution right it's it's guaranteed in different rights right but it says that that court cases over the years have formed what's called a, a penumbral one meaning that the, the group of rights derived by implication from other rights so the idea of like whether it's it's contraceptions interracial marriage same-sex marriage um, but then it also gets into the idea of like right right to data privacy surveillance and 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 you know the idea of, of pills being mailed and and things of that nature, or even even apps that are being used to track like your um, your cycle and things like that, are, are those going to be possibly um, data breaches and things of that nature? So um, some were saying that you know and this is just this is a, a group where they, they looked at they talked to different academics asking that um, on the one hand it may not be that difficult for law enforcement to prove probable cause that someone committed a crime related to one of the newly enacted state abortion laws and get access to search a cell phone, uh, which is kind of concerning. Um, but then, you know, the idea that, that, but then a Tulane University law professor said that privacy can be understood that according to, the, uh, to, uh, to, to Justice Samuel Alito, that privacy can be understood both as a right to avoid unwanted disclosure of information and as the right to make decisions without government interference. But then she goes on to say the court then deeply undermined the second sense of privacy, the, uh, the, the right to government interference, but did not address the first, the unwanted disclosure of information. So... That's definitely, I think, a, a concern, for sure. I wish I had a better answer for you on that one. I don't know if you, if you have anything you want to add, add, Kevin. And if you're interested in learning more about medication abortion and abortion pills by mail or self-managed abortion, um, there is a website called plancpills.org. I've got some stickers from them up here. Um, they track like the best ways to be able to obtain that in all 50 states. Thank you. So if, um, you know, somebody is in a, they find out they're pregnant and they do a Google search and trying to have, uh, you know, find out their options. Um, can you tell us a little bit, uh, Lisa, about crisis pregnancy centers, how that might come up in my Google search? Yes. Um, so there is something, there's a large network of organizations that exist in Illinois and in the US that's really important to know about. And they are called crisis pregnancy centers or CPCs. And they are a very well organized network of organizations that will use um, search engine optimization and paid search advertising to make sure that they pop up in um, abortion searches. And so I know in this area, there are a couple of them. Um, so there's one called Past Pregnancy Center. They're justly affiliated organizations who knowingly spread misinformation and disinformation about abortion, sexual health, contraception, um, adoption, et cetera, um, in service to their anti-abortion agenda. And so, you know, one of the reasons I was so um, grateful to be invited to be here today is because this is an issue that most people, even people who are pro-abortion, do not know about. That when you are searching for abortion care or a friend is searching for abortion care, it is very likely that one of these anti-abortion organizations will pop up and their goal is to get you to come into their office so that they can counsel you. Uh, lay volunteers will counsel you. They are not qualified to counsel anybody. 
um, with materials pr produced by large organizations such as Heartbeat International and CareNet. And they will use um, coercive tactics. They will uh, use guilt trips to scare you from getting an abortion. They will tell you um, incorrect information. Um, we actually have a pamphlet we obtained from inside a crisis pregnancy center on the north side of the city that literally says the first thing is if you have an abortion, you're, you could die. And the fact is you're much more likely to die carrying a pregnancy to term than you are having an abortion. And that's especially true uh, for women of color, people of color. Just, just to jump in on that. Um, so I have uh, just some info. One study looked at 348 pre crisis pregnancy centers that had been included in state provided abortion resource directories. So the researchers found that 80% of them had at least one piece of misleading or false information on their websites. So just, just to give some numbers to what you just said. And then also, like we think of like our kind of searching for information as this kind of, we're gonna get back some good information from Google, right? And I, I'm so glad you mentioned like search op engine optimization. So when you do a search, Google isn't just giving you back the best info, right? Like these um, organizations are gaming the system. And so when you get Google results, you're getting those things up at the top of the page instead of the accurate, safe information um, that you should be getting. And so between that and the kind of um, money that those organizations put into social media for ads and things like that, like we're just surrounded by bad information. And a lot of it is because of crisis pregnancy centers. And they will purposely use um, vague language um, or they'll hide their disclaimer, you know, somewhere on a site where most people aren't gonna look that says does not uh, provide or uh, refer for abortions. Um, so that's something to look for. Um, Cause if you see that on a site, that's one really good indication that that could be an anti-abortion uh, pregnancy center. Um, something else to look for is, you know, if they tend to put a lot of weight on negative aspects of abortion, saying things like it's gonna affect you the rest of your life, you're gonna have depression, things like that. Cause like the thing is with any medical procedure, right? There's gonna be certain risks, but the fact of the matter is the risks are very, very low with abortion and in fact, Again, just, just to make sure, because they won't say this on there, right, but carrying a pregnancy is a serious uh, medical situation as well. Carrying a pregnancy carries with it a lot of health risks, a lot of medical risks that don't just end after you give birth. They can go on for many years after. And so every person has the right to uh, get that accurate medical information and you wanna get that from real medical providers, not these anti-abortion organizations that are claiming to be unbiased. Um, yeah. One way, and for, for anyone who's like me who really likes to dig into things in detail, um, if you need proof that this is what they're doing, all you need to do is find that they have two different websites. Most of them do, okay? They have a website that they want pregnant people to find where there is a lot of pro-choice language. They'll say things like pro-woman. That's a, a, a word they use a lot. But if you also Google search and say donate to whatever the name of the place is, then you find their very separate website that is for their donors and supporters where it will very clearly show that they have an anti-abortion mission. So if you need proof, that's that's where you find it. And just in terms of the that's, that's fascinating. I did not I did not know that. And just in terms of like this the safety aspect. So some of the laws that were being put before Roe versus Wade was overturned, some of the laws that the states were were putting out there because they didn't want to say that they're they just you know anti-abortion laws. They would call them like you know um, pro like women's health um, laws and things of that nature. So they have law like um, aspects of them like you know the, the walls of the clinic had to be yay wide right or um be, and then and the doctors at, at the abortion clinic had to have rights uh, visiting rights at the lo privileges at the local hospital well the truth of the matter is you guys that it, it having a colonoscopy is a more dangerous procedure than an abortion in a clinic because you there's no cutting involved in an abortion and when when lawmakers were questioned um by this in in, in an earlier um uh, um legislative uh, uh assembly session a lot of them didn't know. 
even how it works. So they're making laws about how to basically limit and access abortion rights when they don't even know what even happens in an abortion. So you're you're more likely worse in a colonoscopy if you have if you have a polyp or of some kind, which is also performed in a clinic, by the way. There's there are scalpels involved to remove the polyp, so you have a, a more likelihood of, of bleeding with a colonoscopy, and and those types of procedures are not were never uh, mandated that way. They they didn't have to be the walls didn't have to be a certain uh, you know uh, length of feet wide, or the, the, the doctors didn't have to visiting privileges. At, privileges at the local hospital. You know, these were clearly put in place to limit women's rights to, to have an abortion. And, and I, I do, I wanna just throw something out there because I, I, I think that, the, I think there has to be some room because I mean, we both teach, teach American government and, and I think that, you know, I think that we're both, all of us are concerned about I think the, the discourse in general, general in our country, but there's gotta be room, even if people feel a certain way, it's okay to have disagreements about how, um, you know, if, if people are, you know, they're, they're not, pro, you know, they're, they're pro-life, that is okay. Um, I just, I feel like I wish that we could talk a little bit more about the idea of what's the base problem, which is education overall. And if people are, do not have access and don't have knowledge of education, that's, it's, it's frightening. My, I, I showed my students in, in our marriage and family class, this uh, clip, I think I sent it also to my colleagues here from Vice News about, um, a group of teenagers in, in Mississippi, and they have some of the most restrictive, this was before the Dobbs decision was handed down, but they had some of the most res restrictive things. And of course, the mortality rate, as you were saying, is, is much higher in Mississippi than other states. And um, these teenagers, teenager, teenagers, by the way, were extremely impressive, but one of the girls did not even know what the term contraceptive, co contraception meant. She didn't know what a contraceptive was. She had no clue what it meant. And they were talking about like, well, they don't really, you know, we don't really know about condoms and we're not really taught because they, they're abstinence only education states. So when you're being taught abstinence only, study after study has shown that teen pregnancy rates are higher in those states. So I feel like there's a way to kind of bridge that gap between the pro-life or, or pro-choice, pro-abortion movement, however you want to word it, by saying that maybe if we could focus more on just education overall, I think that would be a way to, in general, when people are more educated, the abortion rate comes down. Because nobody really wants to get, I mean, let's just be honest, nobody wants to get an abortion. It's not something that anyone really like, like yay, hey, that's, I, I'm having an abortion today. No, no one's really excited about that. So it'd be nice if we could find some ways to kind of bridge those gaps. At least that's my, my, my two cents on that. Yeah. I, I oh, wait, wait, wait for the, sorry, the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> and I think a really good point to make is, you know, when I, Again, I'm trying to be logical about this whole thing. And, and when I talk to certain people who have certain views about certain things and, and they talk about the other side, I always think, because I'm, maybe I'm too much of an optimist or something, but I always think, like, what do they have to gain? Like, so, so the side with uh, anti-abortion, like, what would they gain out of a whole bunch of women having children that they don't want? Are they going to gain from having babies? In I, I, I think ultimately everybody's, you know, how, how they think they want to achieve this goal is different. Mm -hmm. But I think ultimately they're both, both sides are trying to achieve a goal, I, I think. Mm -hmm. I don't think either side wants to have a whole bunch of people who are in terrible situations. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think so. I think how each side is going about this is probably different. I know, I know it's different. But ultimately, like what, what, what would one side gain out of the... Yeah, no, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a good question and I think you know, it goes back to something we talked about earlier. One word, power. Who holds the power in this country? Who holds the political power? Who holds all of the money? Who's winning in a capitalist system? It is older white men. And by holding women, people who can become pregnant, people of color, in poverty, they retain that power. Yeah. They, they haven't always been able to though. That's under Roe, there were still major gaps in abortion access. There were still major gaps in sexual health education, major gaps in being able to access contraceptives. This has never been a just system, particularly, particularly for those who don't have the financial means. I mean, and I think this, this conversation to me points to what you were talking about earlier, the need for reproductive justice. So that instead of, right, this debate about like, are abortions um, 
can we have abortions or not have abortions? What are the conditions in which we can um, all choose to have children or not have children, to raise them in a way that like um, doesn't put us into poverty or doesn't cause, like it is so, it's wildly isolating, I think, you know, um, having a kid in this, um, in this country, it's, it's expensive. There's all these things that make it really hard to raise children. Um, and we could change that. And there's so many possibilities for making this a better um, environment for, for parents. Mm -hmm. And I think the conversation around abortion, we don't often get to that conversation, but I think that's the conversation we should, we, we could be having, or that there's an opportunity to have um, when we talk about abortion, that that is something that I think is medically, it's medically necessary. It's something that we need to have access to, but we also need to have access to resources and supports and all kinds of other things that make having a kid like a viable option for mm -hmm. folks. And I, I agree I agree with my colleague, and I, I respectfully disagree a little bit, just from the sense that I don't think that everybody on, in the, on the pro, maybe you're not saying this too, but that everyone on the pro-life movement is necessarily like, they're not evil people. They're not looking, I think some people genuinely feel that they're doing the right thing. I think they genuinely feel like, but I think that perhaps maybe their their notions are, I would say, personally misguided, and like maybe it could be, it, their resources could be maybe put in a different direction and be better used, but they, I think they think that they're right, they're doing the right thing. But I think that, because it's a lot of women, like, so first thing that's only only about like, you know, white men maintaining power, there are a lot of women who abdicate their own right to have an abortion. So, so I mean, I, I don't know if that necessarily fits across the board, um, but you know, there's a, a, a quote from, uh, well, this is actually the lawyer who was arguing the, uh, the Dobbs case, and she was saying that, and I think this kind of sums what we're, summarizes what we're all saying, that you know, if women have an equal right to liberty under the Constitution, and if they're not able to make this decision, if states can take control of women's bodies and force them to endure months of pregnancy and childbirth, then they will never have equal status under the Constitution. And so I think that's, there's, there's that element that's just people are not making that connection between having your, your equality and having it, like freedom of your life and being able to do things and go to, go to college and not be interrupted and have your job. And if you decide you don't want to have a baby when you're 21 because you, you want to, you know, get your, get, go out into graduate school because it's just not the right time for you that, and then that's okay, right? I think that's the, some of the stuff that people, people are missing. Um, so I just, again, I wish we could kind of bridge, bridge those gaps that exist. And we'll never bridge them all the way, but um, and I think that for some people, it's just simply a matter of controlling women's bodies because they are just misogynists. <laughs> yeah, I was, I mean, yeah, right. Like I think there is a, a very powerful subset of that, right? But I think there's also something to acknowledge that, you know, so as, in addition to my work uh, raising awareness about crisis pregnancy centers, I am also an abortion clinic escort. And I have spent many, many, many hours face-to-face -face with uh, anti-abortion activists. And you would be shocked to find out how many of these anti-abortion, particularly the women who are standing out there, have had abortions themselves. Mm -hmm. And so they, it, regret it, basically. they say that they regret it and that because of their Christian ideology that Jesus saved them and showed them the way after. And so therefore they are justified in harassing people who are seeking medical care at a clinic currently. And so this is where then I go back to, if you don't believe in abortion, don't have one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's no reason to take away other people's rights. That, that just doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Other questions and comments from the audience? In psychology, we learned if you, uh, as far as your education, you know, you were trying to tell us about education. In psychology, we learned that most parents don't have a conversation with their kids yes. about the talk yes. and the safety of it. And they're like, oh, it's uncomfortable, and they don't talk about it, and they're never educated on this. And there's higher rates of pregnancy, and, you know, uneducated keeps the cycle going. Yes. It just keeps it going. So that's a, a, you know, statistic there. And then if you talk to kids about it, they're more educated about it. They make better choices. Also, um, what else were we talking about? I'm so forgetful. That's still a great point. That, yeah. You know, yeah. that's about it. And yeah. then, like you, you said, I don't care what you do. 
I'll support you either way. You know, like mm -hmm. I feel like we should be supportive. And those humans that are going to be born are one day consumers, are one day constituents, are one day voters. So we do need, you know, even people like Elon Musk make comments like, oh, we don't have enough people in this world. <laughs> have you seen all the hungry people? Like, I don't, I don't know how we don't have enough. We're not taking care of who we have yeah. here already. So those are future consumers that, mm -hmm. that we're breeding for them. And, you know, the less educated, the more you buy, the more you consume, the, the less you vote, the right. less you care. I'm so right? glad you said that because that's a really, I think it's a point that we kind of should have said ourselves. And again, something we were talking about in marriage and family, just, I don't know, but my mom never talked about stuff with me because her mom never talked about it with her. And we don't have these conversations because they are uncomfortable. And it's like, well, you know, it's also a lot more uncomfortable having your 16 year old be pregnant. That's, that's even more uncomfortable <laughs> or, you know, or not knowing anything. And I was think I was woefully underprepared of knowing stuff. So it's, it's better to have those conversations, but if we don't empower people to feel, but we, there's still this puritanical, the history teacher in me is coming out, this puritanical streak that kind of runs through this country that goes back to this, this like fear of like, we can't talk about sex like this, you know, that we still have that going all these years later. Right. So I know we're low on time here. Mm -hmm. oh, quick question. From like what she said about like the government, like why, what's the point of us like having, bringing children into the world? Like the world right now, like there's a shortage of formula. Like my cousin, my aunt couldn't get my nephew, my cousin a formula because he ran out. He's only 11 months, so now he had to drink like whole milk, which isn't like what he should be drinking yeah. because there's no formula. Yeah. 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 Um. So. I go back and forth because as a woman who's never had to make the decision, like I understand both sides. But um, I have a brother with Down syndrome and I understand that they don't really have many resources. And like I completely understand if someone, like one of his friends, the mom had him at 16. So like I grew up with him and I still sometimes have a hard time taking care of him. Imagine having, be 16 and having a kid with Down. Well like what makes me upset about some stuff like that is like Iceland they've pretty much eradicated Down syndrome because they have tests that are 85% right, mm -hmm. but sometimes they still have a kid with Downs and pretty much the government just doesn't want to take care of it mm -hmm. because yes, it is expensive, but it's still like, it just kind of makes me sad because I ha can't imagine like life without my brother. Mm -hmm. So I think that's when I get upset. It's like the government just doesn't want anything to do with it, but then our government, like we don't want you to have an abortion, but. Then again, they don't want to do anything when the baby's born. Right, they don't want to support you in caring for that kid. Exactly. And I think right. that's the thing. Like, we need money and resources. We don't need to not have Down syndrome kids. Those are special, like, there's all kinds of reasons we sh why we should have all so many different kinds of folks in our, our communities, and we should support them. And whether that's uh, your brother with Down syndrome or it's um, a mom who's struggling to feed her kids, um, having formula, like all of those things are necessary. And abortion is a component of all of those things. Um, you can't have one of those things without the other, I think. Yeah. And, and I know we're pretty much out of time here, so I, I just wanted to say one more thing with the, the excellent comments that we've had that um, supporting the children who are born, especially to perhaps parents who are lacking resources. Many of the states that have the most restrictive policies regarding abortion are also some of the least generous of providing social support um, to low-income um, mm -hmm. parents. So um, I really thought that this conversation was much richer with all of your contributions, yes, um, and, and, and thank you so much. I really wanna thank our panelists too. Um, for, for making this, this is a difficult topic. And um, you know, we, we um, appreciate all your research and, and comments that you made to our group today. Um, so if you could please join me in thanking our, our panel members. <laughs> and just so you know, and, and more for the, the recording too, we have Tish Hayes, the information literacy librarian who uh, along with the other excellent librarians can help with research along with topics like this. Um, and lead us, uh, Lisa Battisfor, um, who is from Reproductive Transparency Now. And uh, you can look up that organization online. And um, 
Mary Fafuis Dunkel, who teaches almost every class at Marine Valley Sociology, <laughs> uh, Political Science and History. So um, again, thank you to my panel members and, and thank you all for being here today. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Troy. <laughs>